This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. But, um, thank you everyone for having me here. Uh, thank you Ernest um, for inviting me to present. Um, thank you Faye for uh, making it all happen. Um, I'll tell you about myself. I'm Deborah Yepo Papan. I'm Jemez Pueblo and Korean. Um, for those of you that don't know where Jemez Pueblo is, it's located in New Mexico. Um, we're about, our Pueblo's about uh, 40 minutes north of Albuquerque. Um, and today is, is our feast day. I mean, if, if it weren't, um, it, today's one of those days where I should be in Jemez and um, participating in, in our feast day. It's one of our traditional um, ceremonial dances that goes on today. And it's, you know, our, our people have been doing that for hundreds of years. And my daughter usually dances, so, um, but you know, finances get in the way, so we can't make it there, but I'm happy to be here, um, not very far from home. I'm from Chicago. Um, I've lived in Chicago all of my life since I was about one year old. Um, I was actually born in Korea, um, and I came here when I was, my mom and I came here to America when I was about five months old. And um, then we relocated to um, Chicago when I was about one after my dad was uh, discharged from the army. And that's where I spent my whole life growing up in, right in the city in um, Logan Square, the Logan Square neighborhood. And now I live there with my husband and my 10 year old daughter and we live in Albany Park, which is a very, very diverse neighborhood. Is anyone here from Chicago? So you maybe you're familiar with Albany Park. It's on the north side of town. Um, anyone ever go to Chicago? Don't you just love Chicago? Um, I love Chicago. It's it's my home. Um, Jemez Pueblo is also my home, um, but you know I, I just I can't imagine living anywhere else outside of um, Chicago. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation um, with some. I mean. My artwork is my story. It's, it's how I tell people about who I am. It's, my work is very identity driven. Um, I'm very proud of who I am and I really try to uh, you know, teach my daughter to be proud of who she is as well. I and mean, she's a mix of a whole different uh, cult, you know, bunch of cultures. Um, I'm Jemez Pueblo and Korean. My husband is Osage, Ka, Cheyenne River Sioux and um, He's got a little bit of mixed European heritage um, from his mom's side, so my daughter is all of those things combined. Um, so people, you know, they always ask, how, how did my parents meet? How does a Jemez Pueblo man meet a Korean woman? Um, he was stationed in the army um, in the 70s, or late 60s, early 70s. Um, he enlisted into the army before he was drafted for Vietnam. Um, and fortunately, he was stationed in Korea. He, did, he missed out on going to Vietnam altogether. Um, so when he went to Korea, he met my mother, and that's how I came to be. Um, so I'm gonna start, again, start my story. Oops, uh-oh, sorry. Doesn't wanna start. There we go. Um, this is my family uh, on my mom's side. Um, this is my mother right here. And she's, in this picture, she's, uh, she's pregnant with me. I think she's in her first trimester. And those are her parents um, to the, the right of her, uh, my Harmony and Haruoji, and my, uh, my aunts and uncles, my uh, emos and uh, Wesumshin. And um, so this was, I think this family portrait was taken before my mother, uh, before we left Korea. So there I am. I think this is my uh, 100th uh, day. Um, in Korean culture, they celebrate uh, the 100th day of um, the baby. Um, and it's, it's a huge, you know, it's, it's a really big deal. So, and you know, they, they celebrate um, almost like a first, you know, first year birthday party. Um, and this is a portrait of me. And there's me and my mom. 
Um, so I was born July 20th, 1971. Um, this is my harmony, my grandmother. Uh, I'm the one with the hat and the little red socks, and she's carrying my cousin also. He's just a couple months younger than I am. But this is the day that we are leaving Korea for America. Uh, I think this was Christmas Eve, which for my mother was such such a huge deal. I mean, she was, I think she was 21 years old when she left Korea. Um, because my father, he was moved back to the States before I was born. So when I was born, my mother wanted to reunite with him. Um, and so she decided that she was going to leave Korea. And her English was just, is very limited. Um, so, you know, I mean, she's, Korean's her first language, and I mean, I, I can't imagine what that was like for a young mother to leave her homeland and come to some place just completely different and completely new. I mean, just what a culture shock for her. And and as a mother, just you know, when you have a newborn baby, you're just you're so protective, and um, you know, I would just be scared of everything. And I just you know, I really admire my mom for having that strength. Um, to do something like that, because she wanted me to grow up with my father. I mean, there's so many. You hear so many stories where um, army men go to, you know, other countries, and then you know, babies are are made. Um, and sometimes some of these kids, they they grow up without a father, or they don't know who their American fathers are. And my mother didn't want that for me. She wanted me to know and grow up with my father and know who he was, who he is. And she didn't want me to grow up um, in a place where I could have been ostracized for being, for being mixed, for being half Korean and half something else. Um, so she, she made that sacrifice to leave. She was the first in her family to leave Korea. Um, so this is my mother as we're getting ready to go. I'm on her back. And she has me wrapped around in a blanket, so that's a traditional way that uh, mothers would carry their babies, and they call that obuba. And so this is, her whole family was there. Um, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, my cousins. So we came to America, I'm pretty sure it was Christmas Day in America, and we came here, and my father was stationed in the army and he was stationed in, I believe it was Mississippi at the time. So we stayed with his family in Jemez Pueblo. So, um, you know, it's, it's our reservation in New Mexico. And I may be biased, but I think we have the prettiest um, reservation of all uh, the Pueblos. We're nestled right in the Jemez Mountains, and it's just, it's gorgeous. So. If you, see, if you can see the, the white mesas in the back, um, those are some of the sacred areas for our people. And we're, you know, our people are farmers, so it's, you know, we have a lot of um, you know, farming land there. And when the hunters go hunting, they'll go way up into the mountains back there and they'll hunt elk and bear. Um, sometimes they, they see lions up there. So and this is my, my grandmother on my father's side um, with my mother and my great aunt. So my mom is, she's a part of oral history in Jemez Pueblo. Um, anytime I go back home, people always say, oh, I remember your mother. She used to walk around the village carrying you on her back. And she was, I think she was the first Korean, the first Asian woman to marry into, um, into the tribe and become a part of the tribe there in Hamas. So she's part of that oral history. A lot of the elders remember her and um, they, they always, every time they see me, they, they still think I should still be a little baby because that was their, their last memory of me. Um, but we go home. We go home to Hamas at least once a year. Ever since I was a kid, my parents, um, you know, they, it was very important for my father to go back to his homeland. So we always made our journey back home. So I always knew what it meant to, to be Hamas Pueblo. 
And I just had to throw that, throw that picture in because it's really cute. And it was me. <laughs> um, so that's me in Jemez Pueblo. And again, this is one of those times. I think this may have been before we moved to Chicago. Um, so we spent some time living in Jemez Pueblo. And I think for my mom, I think that was a good move for her. It was a good thing for her to assimilate into native culture before she had a chance to assimilate into popular American culture. Um, because there are so many similarities with um, Korean culture and Hamas Pueblo culture in, you know, in some of the customs and some of the you know, parts of the religion. So I think that was an easy uh, transition for her. And um, there's even, she, she used to tell me that she learned how to make uh, pottery. And so she would make like Hamas style pottery and paint it. And she actually sold some pottery on the side of the road. Cause sometimes I mean, people, they'll, they'll set up booths and you know, they'll sell traditional foods and um, uh, goods and wares to people you know, passing through. So, you know, I always wonder, you know, if those people that bought her pottery knew that it wasn't traditional Hamas pottery, that it was Hamas pottery made by a Korean woman. So I think that's really interesting. Um, so, and that's me and my dad. And so this is me in Chicago, my hometown. And that's me and my mom and dad. one of my favorite pics of my dad. My dad passed away um, eight years ago. And here is my mom. Um, I don't know if you can see, she's wearing, a, it's a beaded medallion. And um, it's, uh, there are a lot of Native Americans that, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's jewelry, it's Native jewelry. And, you know, I, I just, my mom was so, so instrumental in, in helping me realize that, you know, that I should be proud to be American Indian. Um, she, because she was really proud. She used to brag to her coworkers that, you know, she was married to uh, an American Indian and her daughter is part American Indian. So she really helped me and she really pushed me to, to just be really proud of that. Um, sometimes more so than she pushed me to be proud of Korean, uh, but you know, I, I know that I'm Korean and I, I'm always, I've always been proud of that. Um, I had a very diverse growing up. Um, we used to go to a Buddhist temple because my mom um, was Buddhist, so we would go to a Buddhist temple and I would go with her and it was a Korean Buddhist temple, so that's all I heard was people speaking Korean and eating Korean food. And then we'd come home and then she'd cook something um, that's traditionally Hamas Pueblo for my dad, like a chili stew. Um, so that's, that's why I've included this picture. My mom learned how to make some of the traditional foods from Hamas Pueblo. So there's, um, green, or there's red chili stew, there's uh, Hamas style enchiladas in the front. Those, if you ever go to New Mexico and you go to Hamas Pueblo, get the Hamas enchiladas. Nobody else makes them like that, and those are the best. Um, so they're made with red chili from New Mexico. And then this is just to show the diversity of our meals. Um, I think this was, this may have been Thanksgiving or some sort of celebration, but Korean rice. We always had Korean rice, it's a staple. So whatever we ate, there was always Korean rice on the table. There, my mom just, you know, it's with every single meal. Um, so here we go, we have you know, just the combination of the different foods that, that I grew up with. And this was normal for me. It was normal for me, but in the 70s, it was, I knew that it wasn't the norm for everybody else. So you know, unfortunately, um, you know, I, had to, I kind of pretended that you know, I wasn't as different as, as other people. But now when I look back at it, you know, I, I wish that I was more just, yeah, yeah, so what, I, I eat this kind of food. Um, it seems that people nowadays are, especially children, they're, they're more open and they're more accepting of different cultures and, and diversity. Um, it's, it's embraced a lot more now than it was in those times. And this is my great grandfather, um, Grandpa Tom. He was 101 um, when he passed away. So, um, you know, I, I look back and I wish I was smart enough when I was a kid to have asked him just 
you know, a bunch of questions and just ask them what the past was like uh, before, because my, my dad used to tell me some really cool stories about um, when white people first came onto the reservation and, you know, just how, how, you know, the village used to look before electricity and before, you know, all this like modern technology at that time, which would have been just like street lights in the village. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure my, uh, my grandpa would have had some really amazing stories of what Hamas was like a long time ago. And that's, uh, that's a traditional Pueblo oven called a horno. And that's where they make the Pueblo oven bread, which is, is really, really good. And I should be eating some of that right now if I were in Hamas. <laughs> but um, that's my grandmother. And um, I'm helping her make some bread there. And that's uh, my mom and dad. Um, this was, I think, in 2001. So I was pregnant with um, my, my only child and their only grandchild. My parents were so happy to be grandparents. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I'm really, really proud to be, you know, um, their, their daughter and they really, they taught me a lot. They taught me how to be a good mother and how to be proud of, of you know, my cultures. Um, they were very open, um, very accepting of a, of a lot of things. So um, before I start with the art part, the art presentation, I just kind of wanted to start um, with a story that I wrote. Uh, there's a Native American community writing group in Chicago. Um, we call it Chinudin, which uh, Ernest was a co-facilitator for um, for the past two years. Um, so it's it's just you know there. A lot of urban Indians, we get together and we write and share our stories, and particularly our stories about um, you know coming off the res and coming onto you know living in the big city and just what our lives are like. Not necessarily always you know coming from the res to the city, but it's just our own experiences as Native people. Um, so I'm going to start with this story: um, different worlds. I've always felt like I've lived in different worlds. There was always my world at home when I was a kid with my mom and dad living in two cultures coexisting under one roof, Korean and Hamas. Eating kimchi and rice with a bowl of red chili stew and fry bread was a normal occurrence. Taking off shoes before entering the house was a must. My dad talking in Hamas to relatives on the phone. My mom writing a letter in Korean to my grandmother still in Korea and me absorbing it all into my memories. That was my world at home, a mixed race world, a typical non-American household, at least in those times in the 70s in Chicago. Then there was the world away from home where I had to pretend I wasn't so different. Not that I was ashamed or anything like that, but because I didn't want to have to explain what it was that made me so different. People were a little more intolerant. So I pretended to be assimilated, but my facial features gave me away. I never really cared. I was never really one to care so much what others thought because I had a strong foundation. I learned the ways of the other world, learned to write and speak the other language as best I could because honestly, it's the only language I know. Learned how the other world works so I can function fully in it, but always keeping at heart what was real, what is still real, and that's who I am. I am Asian, I am Native, I am Korean, and I am Hamas. That is the world I am living in. So I'm going to go ahead and start with some art. Um, this is a series I did called I is for Indians. And it's based on you know, just some of the, the typical stereotypes that are placed upon Native people. Um, this was a, a final project that I did when I was in a digital imaging class at Columbia College in Chicago. Um, this was before I had my daughter. And I took, what I did was I took some Edward S. Curtis photographs and just, you know, manipulated them, cut and pasted and, you know, moved things around, um, added all these teepees in. 
and, uh, and then juxtaposed some of the native um, portraits with faces of mine and family and uh, family members and friends. So this is me um, with one of the stereotypes, Indians live in teepees. Um, I'm Hamas Pueblo. Pueblo people do not live in teepees. Uh, that's, those are Plains Indians. And we don't live in teepees now. So um, these are some of the stereotypes, you know, when you tell somebody that you're Indian, it's these, these types of images pop in their head. Oh, okay, so all Indians live in teepees, or all Indians used to live in teepees, or all Indians, you know, we all look the same. We all have long uh, braided hair, or we wear uh, headdresses, which now is really, I mean, all the hipsters think so. That's why they're all wearing all of that garbage. Um, I don't know why they're doing it. Uh, I, I don't know if they understand how uh, insensitive and stereotypical that all is. Um, and this is my father, Indians say how. And again, it's that whole, and my husband actually just told me a story the other day. Um, he walked, my husband's an artist also, and he went into uh, Printmaker Chicago, which is um, where we go to get some of our, our uh, archival uh, digital prints. And he walked in and somebody, the guy at, sitting at the desk said, how, to him. I mean, he literally said, how. And um, my husband just, you know, he, he got really, really mad. So rather than say anything to him, he just ignored him. Um, but I mean, it's unfortunately, these stereotypes, people are still, they're still doing this. And it's, it's not right. Um, so again, here's my dad, who's Hamas Pueblo, and um, he looks like a, a Lakota or a, a Plains Indian. And this is my husband, Indian smoke peace pipes. And my husband is Plains Indian, but he doesn't dress like this every day, if at all. Uh, this is a friend of ours. Um, Indians have red skin, and uh, Hugh is, he is Lakota, um, but again, you know, he's, it's not like he wears a headdress every day. Indian women are called squaws. Um, this is my friend, Mariana. She's a really close friend of mine, and she's actually Quechua from Ecuador. Um, and she's a really, really strong woman, and she's not somebody that you want to, you know, call names or anything. Um, I mean, she'd actually beat you up. Um, so that's why I thought it was perfect to, to put her in, in this scenario here. And again, you know, it's just that stereotypical, um, you know, just the feather and the hair and all that. Um, and this is her daughter, uh, Asia, who is actually Clinkett from, um, her father is a, a native Alaskan, um, and he's Clinkett, and she's part Quechua. And again, Indians wear buckskin. Indians hunt with bows and arrows. And this is a friend of mine, um, he, Vincent, he's Laguna Pueblo. And again, these are just all the stereotypical images that are applied to all Indians across the board, and thus I is for Indians. It's just this whole pan-Indianism uh, with the, you know, with the totem poles. Totem poles are more of a, these, is, in particular, are more um, Northwest Coast based. And they don't live in teepees up there. Um, so now from that, I kind of branched off and started doing more um, personal identity. Uh, this is called Certificate of Indian Blood, CIB. And it's my actual Certificate of Indian Blood with uh, my face on it. So if, I don't know if you can see it closely enough, but um, it says my blood quantum, I am half Indian. So I have, I have Hamas blood, but I'm half Indian. Um, so I think, you know, Native people, uh, Native American people are, I think we're the only group, the only ethnic group that has to identify ourselves by how much blood we have. I mean, I don't think anybody else does that. And we actually, we have to carry our cards. This is how we prove um, who we are and not only just proving who we are, but proving how much of that that we are. 
which, you know, I mean, sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing because then you have a lot of uh, casino tribes that are now changing, you know, they've changed their blood quantums to not include um, people that have, you know, a small blood quantum so that they could, you know, have more of the money, more of the income that comes in from those casinos for themselves and for the people that have more blood. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's good and bad. And this is just another version of that. And that's how this came about, half empty or half full. So it's taking that, that whole idea of, you know, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Um, because being half also, uh, you know, as, as far as identity goes, you know, you have a lot of, what I've encountered are full blood Indians that, you know, tell me that I'm not Indian enough because I'm only half. But, you know, I mean, what does that mean? I know my culture. I know who my people are. They accept me. My tribe accepts me. You know, why can't that be enough? Um, and, and then, too, I mean, there's so many other Native people that don't look Native. Um, I mean, you know, they're, because they're, they're mixed race, but they are so immersed in their native cultures. And I mean, that's what, that's what it means to be Indian. It means to be immersed in your own culture, to know what it means, where your people are from. Um, you know, I honestly, I don't speak my language. I don't speak Hamas Pueblo, but I know it when I hear it. Um, and hopefully, you know, I can, my daughter can, can learn how to speak Hamas, but I mean, we'd have to stay home in Hamas for her to learn that it's a difficult language because it's not written. Um, a lot of the Pueblos forbid uh, our languages to be um, translated or written, um, so it, it's all passed on orally. Uh, these are call me names. Um, these are names that, because I'm both Asian and Indian, I've had to endure twice as many of the uh, derogatory terms thrown at me. Um, when I was living in Logan Square, I remember walking home from the bus one day, and I was walking, and one of the kids in the neighborhood called me Chink. And I was like, you know, I didn't say anything to him. But I thought to myself, wow, you're really stupid, because I'm not Chinese, I'm Korean. Um, so, but, you know, again, it's, you know, if you're Asian, then you, you must all be from China. Um, so, I mean, it's just, there's, there's just a lot of ignorance that, you know, I have to, we've had to battle. Um, and that's, that's where this piece comes from, Savage Indian Oriental Chink, chink and that's me as a baby. I mean, I don't know if you could see in the back, too, it says um, Hamas Korean in uh, black letters all across in the background. So now we go into a little more um, pop-oriented work. Um, maybe this is the only piece. But, uh, you know, obviously I'm influenced by Andy Warhol with this one, um, with the pop art. This is a res car. Um, this is a, a popular item all across Indian country. You know, there's a, a res car on every, every yard. <laughs> um, and of course, everyone says they still work. So auntie says, my auntie, this is my aunt's car, she says it still works. I remember seeing this car in her backyard and you know, I don't know if you can see the rock under the front tire there, it's a flat tire, there's a rock, the hubcaps are all different and it's actually rusty and the seats inside are, you know, all torn and ripped and she claims it still works. So I guess she could start it up but it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so I, I don't know, she may have gotten rid of it by now too or it might still be there. Um, so this is uh, the indigenous version of the famous Magritte, this is not a pipe, uh, Sassine Pazum Peep. So I just kind of, you know, indigenized it and used the, uh, the native smoke, uh, yeah, the, the pipe. He almost called it a peace pipe. Um, so then I took it a step further. And again, this is identity based. Sassine Pazun Indian, this is not an Indian. So again, this is just kind of, um, you know, challenging that idea of what is an Indian supposed to look like. 
I am Indian, but you know, here it says I'm not an Indian. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm obviously not a, a Plains Indian. Um, but I mean, you know, it just it brings about I think a lot of questions. There's identity questions there. And going more into the pop imagery, um, Hello Kitty teepee. My daughter. This was when my daughter was I think four years old. And you know, she and I are big Hello Kitty fans. You know, you can get Hello Kitty on almost anything. So I thought, well, you know, but I haven't seen a Hello Kitty teepee. So I created the Hello Kitty teepee. Um, and you know, I mean, Hello Kitty being that you know really iconic, uh, you know, um, pop imagery from from Asia, from Japan. Um, so I mean, there's that that kind of Asian tie-in right there with that. But also, um, I mean, the deeper, I think the deeper message here is just, it's the commodification. Um, because here you have, you know, Hello Kitty, which is on everything, and on here it's on the TV. But then it's also, you know, it, it talks about the commodification of, you know, these stereotypical images, these native, the native imagery. So live long and prosper, Spock was a half-breed. Um, so, you know, there's another just kind of connection um, in science fiction there with Spock, who is a half-breed, and I'm a half-breed. This one came out, um, I was doing a, a science fiction, a, a Native American contemporary science fiction show, um, art show, and, you know, I was struggling to, you know, get this, just to come up with an idea for a piece for the show. So I went back to my original series, the I is for Indian series, and I looked at the you know, Indian say how. So I was sitting there like this, and all of a sudden my hand just went like this, and I thought, perfect. Um, so live long and prosper. So that's why instead of the Indian saying how, the Indian is um, giving you the Vulcan salute. And then there's just that, there's that connection with uh, Spock being a half-breed. Um, these last two, the Hello Kitty TP and this one, um, they're, they're I, I guess they're, they're my classic pieces. Um, they've, they're, they've been in many shows all around the country. They're actually touring Russia right now. Um, they've been in Russia since uh, June. And um, they're still just touring Russia. I think they're in Siberia somewhere now. Um, they've also been published in a magazine, Red Ink Magazine. Um, they've also been in the National Museum of American Indian uh, magazine. And they're actually going to be a part of a book coming out called War Baby Love Child. Um, and it's a book of artwork, um, interviews, and whatnot of Asian American uh, mixed race artists. And I am one of two artists that's representing um, the, the native and uh, Asian mix in there. And as well as a, a traveling exhibit that's gonna open um, at the DePaul Art Museum in Chicago. So um, several years ago, my family and I um, had this wonderful opportunity to be part of this huge um, community collaboration. Um, when you go to Chicago, um, you're all familiar with Lakeshore Drive, I think. Yeah, so when you get off Lakeshore Drive at Foster Avenue to get back, um, you know, you, to, you have to go under uh, Lakeshore Drive, so there's the underpass, and there are these two huge walls. And um, on these two huge walls um, are these bricolage murals. Um, Ernest was also a part of a part of this project. Um, it was a project. Uh, it was the Chicago Public Art Group um, in conjunction with the aldermen of that area. She wanted to do a Native American themed mural, and uh, this is one of the. Um, I think if not, this is the largest uh, public art piece in Chicago. Um, but the Chicago Public Art Group, the lead artists, they wanted this to be done right. They didn't want to just, you know, make their own interpretations on what Indian art is or what Indian art should be. So they consulted with Native Americans in Chicago, um, and that's how Ernest and um, me and my family got involved with this. So we were part of this project from the very beginning, from the planning, the, you know, just from the design of the whole thing to down to the actual installation. 
So this is my piece, um, half empty or half full, um, that was put on tiles and was actually, it's, it's on that wall, so it's on there permanently for as long as the, the wall will survive. So my husband also, um, he put the skater up there because we really want people to know that Native people are still here and we're very much a part of you know, what everyone else does. Um, and skateboard culture right now in Indian country is really, really huge. So there are companies um, called Native Skates, uh, Apache Skateboard, so this, my husband, this was his homage to, to those guys, our friends with the Apache skateboard there. And it's actually the skateboard, I don't know if you can see it, it's a relief. So it's not um, flat. So there's a lot of uh, different elements to this mural. And um, there's a lot of reliefs and, you know, like art, just, uh, you know, like pictures, <coughs> photographs on tile that are part of this. And this is my daughter, um, Jihei. And that's our family portrait that is up on the mural um, on the north wall. So she was seven at the time, and she was the youngest uh, steer, uh, member on that steering committee, the Native American Steering Committee. So my daughter is actually my, um, she's my masterpiece. Um, I, you know, she's, she's the center of my universe, and a lot of my energy goes into raising her. And this is a picture of her the first time that she danced uh, at one of our feast days in Hamas. Um, this was August 2nd, two years ago, she, so she was eight years old. And it's a huge, it's a huge deal. Um, I didn't push her to do it. I didn't tell her that she needed to do it. I just asked her if she wanted to do it. I asked her if she wanted to dance, and she said she did. So I did everything that I could to make it happen for her. Um, so this was the first time that she danced. Because you know, you have, to, you have to get the dress, and you have to buy the, the manta, and there's the belt, and the moccasins, and then they wear um, the jewelry and everything. And then we have to be there um, several days before the actual feast day, because they have to practice um, their dances. And she, she really, really enjoyed it. And you know, the first time I saw her dance just really made me cry, because um, it was such a proud moment. And my dad had already passed on, so I knew that that was something that he would have been very, very uh, proud to have seen, though I know he was watching her. And these Pueblo dances are powerful. They are so, so powerful. Because um, after they danced, uh, I mean, it was, you can see in this picture, it's really bright and sunny. There was not a cloud in the sky. But as soon as they finished dancing, these clouds just came in from nowhere and it just started pouring rain. Pouring rain just as soon as that last dance was finished. Um, so, I mean, it's really, it was so, so powerful. Um, again, it's just something that, you know, you feel really deep down inside. and. Um, just brought tears to my eyes. I was so proud of her. And then she even told me today, she said, next year, Mom, you're going to dance with me because I've never danced before in my life in Hamas. So I think um, I'm going to have to do that now for her. So that image of her in her manta dancing for the first time um, has just, you know, it, it led to this whole new series of work um, I mean, it's this, I think this, this series is more, it focuses on her, it focuses on how proud I am of her, but also it's, it's very, um, a lot of these pieces are more, they delve more into our spirituality. Um, so, I mean, so the titles will kind of lend to that with this one, it's connectivity. So it's just kind of that, it's that connection that we still have and maintain with the spirit world. And, and I'm using imagery like the bricks to you know, show that we're urban too, that that's, that's our environment. Um, you know, we have brick walls all over. Um, little dancer dragonflies, and again, this is her. Um, and this time I've, you know, I'm trying to incorporate more um, Asian imagery. So um, there's like the dragonflies and then the origami paper with the butterflies behind her. And what I'm doing differently now, too, is these are digital inkjet prints, and these are printed on ledger paper. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, ledger art. 
uh, Native Americans um, are really, well, Plains Indians um, are known for ledger art. And um, if I can split, explain this correctly, my the way my husband explains it is um, when Indians were um, put into prisons, basically, or you know, encampments, um, to kind of help them pass the time, they were given used uh, ledger books. So on those ledger books, they would, um, you know, make art. So they would draw pictures or paint pictures, and those those the imagery that they would put on the ledger paper was it was storytelling of what was going on at the time. So sometimes you'll see ledger art with, um, you know, like with a warrior on a horse, um, you know, with a bow and arrow, either hunting, hunting buffalo or um, killing, you know, an American soldier. Um, so, and sometimes they can get pretty graphic with, you know, with um, dead soldiers and blood everywhere. Um, but, I mean, that was the story, that was what was going on in those times, and that was the story that they were telling um, with, their, with their way of drawing on ledger paper, um, or they even depicted just what their lives were like before their lands were taken and before they were forced into, um, you know, these prison, these encampments. Uh, so that tradition kind of carries on. There's a lot of Plains Indian artists that still draw on ledger paper, but now they do more um, contemporary images, though they still choose to, to draw in that old style. So you'll still see Indians wearing, um, you know, wearing the, the traditional regalia or whatever. Uh, my husband, um, he does ledger art, but his, his work is, is much more contemporary. He does, you know, um, graphite pencil on ledger paper. Um, this is contemporary ledger paper. And so I took it the next step further and started printing um, these uh, digitally manipulated images onto ledger paper. And again, just keeping it more contemporary and pushing it forward. And Ernest is also doing ledger art too. Um, butterfly dancer, which in some Pueblos they do do butterfly dances. And uh, there's a lot of symbolic meaning to, to, these, um, to these things. I mean like dragonfly, dragonfly symbolizes power and poise, prosperity, harmony, good luck, purity, happiness. Um, butterflies symbolize free love and happiness. Um, and I read somewhere that I guess in some Native American cultures they believe that if you catch a butterfly and you, um, you know, you just whisper your, your wishes or, you know, your prayers to it and you let it go, um, it'll, it'll carry your message to the creator and it helps to restore the balance of nature is, is the symbolism in that. Um, So yeah, I mean, and these are things, you know, to me that my, my daughter embodies a lot of these, you know, um, these things for me. Because for me, she's, you know, she's harmony, she's good luck, she's pure, she's, you know, she makes me happy. And her name is Jihe, which in Korean means wisdom. So with this one, I've incorporated um, the, the tiger, the Korean tiger, which is a, you know, powerful symbol in Korea. And uh, divine spirits is um, because it's, the tiger symbolizes good luck, and it's it's highly revered as a divine spirit guardian. Um, and because you know, this is again my way to just honor my daughter. And you know, to me, she's divine. She's as divine as the tiger is, um, and that's why I've called this one divine spirits. So again, I've taken those same images and printed on um, origami paper. And then here, uh, the series, I forget my own title sometimes, Divine Wisdom um, is the, the top right. Uh, harmony is the top left. Interconnectedness bottom right and sublime um, bottom left. So again, this is just, you know, combining everything that is who we are, who my daughter is. Um, I don't know if you could see closely enough, but 
uh, the one here on the top left, um, it's a picture of her. She's wearing, you know, this really cool leopard coat, and she's wearing her Converse, her, her chucks, and, um, you know, she's just this really cool urban kid. And that's in our alley. And then we've got, I've got the train, um, the CTA train at the bottom. The flower is uh, the Mugunghwa, which is the uh, national flower of Korea. Um, and that symbolizes determination, perseverance um, of Korean people, but I also think it's appropriate in describing Native American people because we do, we, we are very determined and we've you know, persevered a lot, we're still here. Um, and then this is just you know, um, adding in those, those contemporary images. We've got the CTA map on there because we're very Chicagoan too. Um, you know, she loves the city. She loves living in Chicago. She loves the diversity. She loves everything about it. Um, so, I mean, we're, as much as we are Korean and Native American, we're Chicagoans as well. And these are all printed on, uh, these are actually printed on antique ledger paper. So the antique ledger paper is from the 1890s, I believe. So I just kind of took my husband's ledger paper. And so again, that's our train. And this is Jihei. Um, this was last year at this time, um, the November 12th Hamas feast day um, when she danced. So she, she wants to continue that. She wants to keep dancing, which is what they say back home is once you dance, you never want to stop. And then this is me and my family. And this was us in Santa Fe this past year. Um, we're all, you know, we're all very involved in what we do. Um, my husband and I have been together for over 20 years. And um, that's his artwork behind us too. Um, so that's, that's our family. Um, so I'm gonna finish with my last story, again from the Chinodin writing group. And um, this, is, this is more about me and uh, Jihei. Urban raised. I was not born in Chicago, but I was raised here in the city. I'm a city girl to the bone. Don't ask me to go camping because I will not. I love the city for all its diversity and culture. I am diverse, but all this is not to say I don't enjoy visiting the woods, the country, or the mountains. I love the mountains, and it's the Hamas Mountains I love the most. If it weren't for the family trips to Hamas when I was a kid, I don't know if I would appreciate someplace other than Chicago. I like to go home to Hamas. Only there can I see the entire expanse of the sky the mesas and mountains making up the horizons, the turkey vultures flying overhead, and the coyotes crying in the distance. At night, it is darker than dark and ever so quiet, except for the occasional res dog barking at something only it can see. I'm afraid of the dark. I miss my orange city lights. Only do I feel safe when the sky begins to lighten. My daughter Jihei was born in Chicago. She is being raised here. She is a city girl through and through. She's more diverse than I am, made up of two parents of many cultures. She loves the city. Diversity is natural to her. But unlike me, she would go camping in a heartbeat if asked. She loves nature hikes and being out in the woods walking wet, muddy, marshy trails. We've picked up the tradition of going to Hamas once a year. I can tell Jihei feels right at home when we're there. We take our drive up to the mountains, to the place where we spread my father's ashes. We love it up there. We're at peace and feel like we're with my dad. There's hardly ever anyone else there. The air is cool and crisp. It's quiet, except for the sound of the running stream and the occasional little bird squawking at us if we get too close to the tree where its nest is. We talk to the bird to reassure it that we're not here to bring it harm as we move along on our way. Jihei loves it here. I think she feels her grandfather's presence. We make it back to the village before it gets dark. Because like me, Jihei is afraid of the dark too. I think she misses her orange city lights. Thanks everyone.